Whatever. Okay. It's important that you get this. And it all has to go back to the problem that we're trying to solve. We want to make our account class friendly and useful because that's what we're aiming for. Which means that if I do things like in my program, if I go in here and go console.writeline A there, it does something friendly and useful. It doesn't just print out the name of the class and then stop. What I wanted to do is print out this account is owned by Rob, it's account number 1234, and it has 50 pounds on it or whatever. That's what I want. And so I get that effect by replacing the behavior which would normally be produced by two string with a customized one. And the way I do this is by this thing called overriding. Now, there's a whole bunch of concepts you have to get into your head one after another in succession for this to make sense. But if it's difficult to understand, keep going back to the intent. Plenty of room down the front, folks. Always. <laughs> it's a lecture by, by God. So, I'm going to give the account a behaviour for two string that actually makes it useful. Should probably say name rather than name, I reckon. But that's not really what we're talking about. Okay, I was oh, get confused. So get rid of that and put M in. Fine. Fine. I could make it produce the uh, uh, account number as well. Let's just do that too. Plus. Account number. There it is. Plus um, the word balance, I guess. There you go. Is that all right? That seems it seems mostly happy. Yeah. Okay. So now it prints out the name, the account number, and the balance. And the idea is that this thing returns a string. It doesn't print anything, so I can use this anywhere I fancy. So now when I run the program, if we just run it very quickly. I'll whack a breakpoint here so we can see it bang then oh that's cool snaps is really awesome snaps is my new framework how did you do that whoa well I've no idea what's happening <laughs> <laughs> oh I know what's happened yeah yeah um, what's happening is that I've actually dropped the program I've opened the program source file not the program um, actual project. So if I go in here and I go, that was really weird. Parallel universe time. I'll be releasing snaps into the wild fairly soon. We'll have a play with it. In fact, I'd, I'd value your comments. Back to the plot. Open. Recent projects and solutions. Account manager. There you go. It gets very confusing if you open. Yeah, just run it. See what happens. Bang. Hmm. There you go. It's, it's doing. It's doing sort of right. Oh, go! What are you doing now? What's all this rubbish for? Now I am confused. If you get this layout mess, you go Windows. You go Reset Window Layout. Where is it? There. Yeah. Tidy everything up. Boom. Thank you. Now, run it again. So I'm still not happy. This is, this is still the wrong one. Let's try it again. Let's get it right properly. D -d 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 recent. What was the project called? I can't remember. It was called Static Demo? Yeah, probably. Nope. <laughs> remember? I could check the recording. Ha ha. I think it was called Etiquette Demo, wasn't it? Where is it? Open. Project Solution. Uh, there you go. Etiquette. Boink open ah lovely and it's even got the changes i just put in yes it has it's even ch changed it from name to name right now we're in business now i'm a happy bunny wham that's a lot quicker there it's calling the uh two string 
and wham, and it's printing the result. So look in here, and it's printed out name, Rob, number one, two, three, four, balance equals zero. Fantastic. I'm missing some spaces, yeah, okay. Let's put that right, put a space in there, and a space in there. But the thing is that I'm starting to mess around with the mind of C sharp and adding things and plugging them in. If you think about a new class, when I make a new class, like a count, I'm actually binding something into the fabric of C sharp. I'm making a new object, which is part of the C sharp framework, and it can play by the C sharp framework rules by doing things like adding its own versions of some of the behaviours that C sharp likes to have in its objects. Does that kind of make sense? We have a behaviour which says that if I ever need the string version of you, I'll call your toString method. And that's enshrined in the object class, which sits right at the very top, and doesn't do a lot. If you have a look at the object definition, if I go in here and I go go to definition, then bang, doesn't have a lot to say for itself. It's got some, some methods, um, uh, equals, reference, equals, blah, 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 blah. But it doesn't do an, an awful lot of any great interest because it's basically a placeholder. It's basically the thing that everything else extends. And int, uh, if you go, let's have a look at int. Just have a look, just for, just for Robert's amusement. And um, I'll show you how this really works. Int i. Go in here, right click, and go, go to definition. Okay, int's got loads of things in it. And int can do loads and loads of things, and it's structure and blah, blah, blah. Um, and it actually extends the object class, but doesn't tell you that, which is annoying of it. Um, but uh, everything, if you just give the class name, extends the object type. So here, if I want to, I can actually explicitly put that in, in place. But account is based on object. In other words, if I go back to my slide deck, wrong one. Oh, this is what we do. This guy here. That's how it works. When I make myself an object, I actually get an object. If I make a class that extends that, I get everything the object can do, plus the bits that the account can do as well. And that was an interesting sound. I don't know why I did that. Anyway, so, i sort of okay with this now. Does it make more sense? Think about the problem that we're solving. We want to make our account behave in a useful, friendly way. And one way to do that is to replace the two-string method with a more applicable version. And this is done on the basis of this magical thing called overriding, where overriding basically says, I want to make use of the one specific to me, not the one in my parent. Uh, the weird thing about class-based design, if you think about it, but well, here's the thing. What's the dumbest and stupidest class in my class hierarchy going to be every time? Which is the class that can always do least? Which is the thickest one? Any thoughts? Yeah? Will it be like a child? No, no. That is the problem that people have. If, if, I, if I draw a diagram of a company or something, I'll put the boss at the top and I'll have all the minions underneath, correct? And the further down the the higher, at the university we have the vice chancellor up here, okay, and then me somewhere down below this floor okay uh, uh, and, and uh, that's how you would arrange it, king goes at the top and then all these subjects go underneath, right, fine when you do that in object world object goes at the top and account comes down here, and account can do lots of things that object can't correct? so the further down the hierarchy you get the more useful and intelligent that you get um, this is, and, and so the idea here is that it's not intuitive. The thing at the top is the dumbest thing. The thing at the top is, is, the, is the object, and that can't do anything much. The first thing we do when we try and make a program that holds useful data is extend the object and make something which is close to what we want. So we'll make ourselves, I don't know, um, an account, a bank, um, a structure, to a player, or whatever, and we'll put things in and give it behaviours that make sense in that context. So all the time, we're actually adding features and overriding methods in the parent. Does that kind of make sense? It's called object-based design. We'll do more of it in, in a week or two's time when we get to class hierarchies proper. But for now, I'm getting you to understand that there's some aspects of class behaviour which 
work because we replace the behaviour in the parent class with one that makes more sense to us. Uh, and so here's the like the chapter and verse of what the two things mean. Uh, this is a good one to remember in terms of uh, exam questions because it's always a question in the exam which asks you to compare and contrast overload, overload and override. Um, overload is the one where you have different signatures and override is the one where you're replacing the behaviour in your parent. Um, and that's it. You have to just learn those um, because as long as you've got the idea that you have to, to do both, you'll be fine. But it's kind of useful to know which is which. Any questions on that? It's a fundamental... Uh, I'm playing around at the moment with uh, writing games in the uh, uh, Snaps framework, and I've got several different kinds of sprite. I've got a very dumb sprite that can just display a picture on the screen, and that sits... Well, here's the thing. I've got two, two kinds of sprite. One is dumb, and can just draw itself on the screen, and one can move around and bounce off stuff and detect collisions and all that kind of funky stuff. Which is the parent? The parent is always the dumb one. Uh, don't mention this at home. My experience, it's always the kids that can do less than me. <laughs> well, the kids have a different opinion on this. Um, in, in, in real life, yeah, the, the, the kids are always useless, and the parents are the clever ones, I tell myself. Uh, but uh, in programming, the, the actual, the further down the hierarchy you get, the more interesting things are. So my parents' sprite, all it can do is just display itself on the screen at a certain position. But the children of that can actually move around, they can be controlled by the joypad, they can do all kinds of interesting stuff, because they have got more behaviours. And every single sprite has an update behaviour, which says, hey, update yourself, it's time to actually uh, do whatever it is that you do. And the parent one at the top, its update behaviour is empty, it doesn't do anything, it just sits there. Because it's a background. If it was a scrolling background, the update behaviour would make it draw itself a little bit further along each time. So you've got like a scrolling Sonic Hedgehog type of uh, thing going on. But that's a cleverer one. The dumb one just draws itself. And the whole basis of the chapter I'm doing at the moment in this book thing that I'm working on is that what we're going to do is, is have this situation where we start with a dumb sprite, then we make the ones you shoot at, we make the ones that are the bullets, we make the ones that's the player, we make the one that's the background. And away we go from there. So start getting your idea into, this, into your head that not only can we make objects that represent things in our program, like toothbrushes, bank accounts, banks, whatever, but we can actually use those as the basis of other objects. So we can pick up behaviours from the parent and just change the ones we're really concerned about, which is a nice way to do code reuse. So that's what we're doing, that's why we're there. Um, it's Going back to etiquette, then the reason why we have two string is because it's useful. It's a nice thing to do if you can actually put up on the screen a string that describes the contents of, of what's in there. And I can put this in a message box, I can print this out, I could write it into a log file, because it's basically a lump of text. You might have to pass that round, you realise. <laughs> One takes a bite and passes it on, there's no way that could end badly. <laughs> OK, fair enough, right, OK. Uh, yeah, like, next time all bring food, it seems... No, don't do that. That's, that's another way around, isn't there? Which makes more sense. Anyway, I digress. So, are you all OK with that? Yep, no, maybe, whatever. Keep it going back to the thing you want to do, like get a string that describes what's in here. Similar kind of thing is equals... Equals is something which we're used to using in a mathematical term. X equals equals Y. We're okay with that? Are these two things the same value? Works a treat with value types because we can compare the values. So I can compare two floating point. Is it sensible to, to compare two floating point numbers? No. No. Depends on why. I have this, I have, do the game and uh, your sprite, okay. Uh, and you put some... Do you know how you make friction in a game? Here's a question for everybody. How do you make friction in a game? How does Robert make friction in a game? Does he go all Newtonian and add forces and vectors and all that kind of stuff? Does he? 
But the thing about games, if we're playing games, the number one thing about games is you cheat like crazy. You don't do things how they're supposed to be because they're probably a bit slow. You'll do something which cheats. And so what Robert does to get friction is he multiplies the speed by 0.9, say. And so remember the game is updating, say, 60 times a second. If I multiply the speed by 0.9, every time I do it, it gets a bit smaller, okay? So the thing slows down. So it looks a bit like friction. It's not really friction, but it looks like it slows down and stops. Does that make sense? The problem I have is it never actually stops because I keep on multiplying it by, and the number just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So if, if I say things like, when the sprite stops moving, we do something, then my program just sort of, <laughs> it just sits there, and the sprite's now going really, really slowly, but it's still not going zero. So you can't really just uh, test things for equality because they won't get there. So I say, multiply it by 0.9 till it stops, but when it gets below, so below 0.0001, that's stopped. So I have to put in some, uh, some clamping to fix it. Um, Floating point numbers, you shouldn't really compare for equality. You can do less than and greater than, but you shouldn't really compare them to keep them the same. Um, so, yeah, games, great fun. Friction. If you're playing Mario Kart, when you go over one of those speed bump things that speed you up, do you know how they do that? They multiply your speed by a number bigger than one. So, you go faster. So you can have bits of your board that slow you down, which is sticky, and bits of your board that speed you up, which are like whooshy bits, and they can just do that by making you fly off. And it's quite interesting how you can get really people going, that's quite clever. No, it's two lines of code. But I don't tell them that, because otherwise they'll, they'll see behind, behind the curtain and whatever. So, back to the plot. Yeah, okay, so we don't want to compare floating points, because that's silly, because they're never the same. We can check to see if they're near enough, that's what we do. But in the case of accounts, I might want to compare them. Why? Why do I want to, to compare two accounts? What's the situation where I wants to do that? Yeah? Yeah, I could check to see if two accounts, if I'm making the same account twice. Uh, would that ever happen if I got my head screwed on? No. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Um, there's an interesting thing about accounts and banks we'll come on to next week, which is that you think about it, well, I'll ask you all now to see, see how awake we are. Plenty of time. Who's in charge of making account numbers in a bank? World banks. Yeah, that'd be nice. There's, there's, there's two classes in my bank. There's the account class that keeps track of all the accounts. And there's the bank class that holds all the accounts. Who's in charge of making account numbers? Well, there's two possibilities. There's the account class and the bank class, correct? Which do you... Who, hand at the back, yeah? <laughs> that, the man at the back is right with the money. Uh, it would have to be the bank because the account has got no way of knowing which numbers have been taken, correct? So whenever I make a new account, I say to the bank, hey, I'm making a new account for Rob. Can you give me a new account number, please? And the bank will go off and get one and come back, and that will be the account number for that account. And the bank will make pretty darn sure that we don't have two accounts with the same number. So I can make my own throwaway accounts, but as far as I'm concerned, they can have whatever number you like. But the bank is in charge of giving out account numbers. We'll put them in the account when we construct it, and because we don't provide any way of changing that, we can lock the, banks into the, uh, the accounts into the bank. Does that make sense? Okay, so... It's an interesting thought to make sure that we don't make two accounts that are the same. But I've got a much better reason wanting to compare two accounts for equality. What would that be? What am I very keen on? Apart from cheese, pinball and photography. That's about it really. It's my life. And not even that much pinball. What am I quite keen on? When I make a programme, what do I try and do? Yeah, money. money yes. <laughs> so I get a really people have a really warped opinion of me. Yeah, yeah money is nice, be, but I, too much money. I, I can't understand. I, I can't understand people that want large amounts of money. No idea what they want to do. Anyway, um, money is good. What do I? What, how do I sleep at night? 
on a big pile of money. No, that's not true. Knowing your children are safe. Knowing my children are safe. <laughs> like I care about them. Uh, this is being recorded. Oh, good. Um, yeah. When I'm making a piece of code, I want to be sure the code is good. What do I do to make sure of that? Test it. Test it. Okay. What would it be kind of useful to have when I'm testing my load and save behaviours? If I write the account to a file and then bring it back, I kind of need a way of making sure that both accounts have got the same information in them, correct? I need some way of saying that that save worked or that save didn't. I need a way of saying, do these two accounts contain exactly the same information? Because if I can't do that, I've got no way of knowing if my save and load is working, correct? I make a ton of tests when I start. As soon as I get my save behaviour sorted, I make a ton of tests where I'm going to make lots and lots of random accounts, and then I'm going to save them all and bring them back and compare them with the originals, aren't I? And if they're different, my save system is broken. If they're the same, I've won. Okay? So, it's actually on the slide. <laughs> Bottom the bullet point. But no one looks at the slides. Why would you want to do that? Okay, so, to do that, I need an equals. And I could test my equals behaviour by doing something like this. If you look at the object class, it has got an equals behaviour which we can call, that's my first account, that's the other account, A is being having the equals called, B is being fed in, so I can compare these two guys. And equals returns true, oops, pardon me, if they're both the same. So this thing here, is a behaviour that will check to see whether my two objects contain the same information. And if they do, it'll return true. Now, I'm going to have to make that because the C-sharp system does not know which bits of my object are important to me and which bits have to be compared for equality. But can you see it's a useful thing to have and from an etiquette point of view, it's a good idea to have this to test your save and load because you can't test save and load unless you've got this in place. So, we have to write our own equals and to do that, we replace the behaviour in the parent class with one that actually we can use to prove that two things are the same. And this is, this is the equals method that I could use if I just had a name and an address in the account class. And so we see that word override again because I want to replace the actual parent equals with what I'm going to write. It's Boolean because it returns true or false. This bit's rather annoying. It's past an object. Now what am I comparing? What's my equals working with? account. So why am I passing an object in? Seems wrong, doesn't it? Okay, this is going to hurt your heads. Well, I apologise for that. Where does object live? Well, in, in the tree, where's object? At the top. Right, okay. Everything in my class system is descended from object, correct? So object is the ultimate parent. And everything underneath object picks up all the behaviours of object, yes? Okay. So everything in my entire system can do what an object can do. It must be able to because it's descended from object, correct? Now... As soon as I drop down the class hierarchy, <laughs> things start getting extra behaviours that the parents don't have. So, for example, in the bank account, account's got pay in funds. Does object have pay in funds? No. So, when we're talking about passing references into things like equals that have got to work on any kind of thing, we have to make this method accept a parameter of type object because everything is able to do what an object can do. 
And everything has got the fundamental behaviours that object has got. So we pass in an object. Oops. We then cast it. We say, I know you're an object, but I want to turn you into an account. So I do this line. And that actually, we've done casting before. We've cast from, it, from floats to integers, which is fine. Now I'm casting from reference to object to reference to account. And as soon as I've done that, the compiler goes, OK, you're an account now. So I can get your name out, and I can get your address out, and I can compare. If the name isn't the same as the name of the account I'm comparing with, I return false, they're different. If the address isn't the same as the one I'm comparing, I return false, because you're different. Otherwise, I return true. So it chugs down all these conditions, looking for something which is different, and finally, at the end, if it's got all the way to the end without finding a difference, it must be the same. Does that make sense? So I put in tests there that compare the balance and the customer number and the other stuff. And if any one of them is different, I return false. But if they're all the same, I get to the bottom and I return true. Is everyone kind of okay with that? So this is how I do it. And, and the bit which, yeah, the bit that I'm most concerned about is that we have to give the equals method an object to work on because it's the only thing it understands. But then we change it to an account by using this cast thing. Then we get hold of the members of the account and away we go. Shall we make one? Let's make one. So I go into my account class and I go down to the bottom where the two string is and I go public override equals and there it is. And so now I go account, is it called, it's called compare to to equals do the cast the way that casting works if you spell it correctly is that the type in brackets is what you're telling the compiler this is what I'll make it a bit bigger Hang up. this thing in brackets says that's the target type I want you to one of those please uh, and then having done that we give it the thing that's being cast in this case it's OBJ so object comes in we tell the compiler actually it's an account because it is because the equals is running inside the account class and now I go if uh, name not equal to compare to dot name then what do I do are they the same no they aren't I send back false and I go if count balance or count let's do account number next not equal to compare to uh, dot account number then return false and just keep on going down uh, working through the other ones as well um, and if I like them all, then I'm going to ignore base. I'm just going to go return true. So now, if the name's different, it'll return false. If the account number's different, it'll return false. So now I can do my equals. I can say things like, well, let's have a little play. Make an account call. I love, I love block copy. Not. So there you go. Let's go. These guys are going to be the same. So I'm going to go if a dot equals b um, console dot right line they are the same right is that going to work let's see watch what happens when we run through the code put the breakpoint in run it up so we've over not very helpful there you are we've overridden the equals method so I'm going to get control when we start doing that equals thing here we go go fetch the reference that's my name that's the one in the thing I'm comparing with they're both called Rob that's fine that'll pass boink now we move on to uh, yeah hang on what's just happened oh dear do it again this time in English with your brain turned on so 
step into. Thank you. Doink. So, yeah, the name is the same. The account number is the same. Return true. <coughs> and now it prints the message. But you'll probably never see it because it's always passed. Oh, that's all right. There you go. They are the same. So, from a good manners point of view, it's a nice idea to provide a method which lets me find out if two things are the same and a method which lets me print things out on the screen. Does that kind of make sense? Is everybody all right with this? <laughs> yep, a question. Uh, how come when you compare any accounts it lets you directly access the name of the compare to rather than calling the method? I love that question. Question is, hang on, these things are meant to be private. How come my equals method can get hold of the name directly? What's going on here? Good question. Anyone know the answer? Yeah? Remember? Uh, it's the attribute, isn't it? Nope. Good thought, though. Where's this code running? Where's the equals method live? Where's the equals method being held? You haven't really spotted this, but I'll, I'll just troll up to the top. Equals method lives inside the account class. Quite a big account now. There you go. So if I just compress all these guys so you can see... The equals method actually lives inside the account class. So it will have access to all the private members because it's a member of that class. So what happens is that when we do the equals thing, execution jumps to the method inside the account class that will do the comparison, and there it is. So the reason why we can get hold of stuff inside the account is because we are inside the account. We live in, we're living inside the account class at that point. So we can do anything in here, we can touch what we like, because we're actually inside it. What's happening is the outside world isn't acting on account to find out if two things are the same inside it. Account itself is providing the behaviour. This is a really important point. Because what we're going to do is put all these behaviours inside the object. In my game... I have a method which updates the sprite and makes it move across the screen or bounce off things or do what not. Where should that method live? The method that updates the sprite and makes it move across the screen and, and do its sprightly thing. Where should that method live? In the sprite. In the sprite. So all the behaviour for your object should live inside the object. Then it's got access to all the properties and things that make that object uh, hold the data that we want to work with. So the fundamental principle here is that absolutely equals is inside the account object because that's where it's best to put it. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm trying to get you thinking that now I can do my programs and I can write my loops and whatnot and I can manage data. The whole business of the next sort of I'll be spending my professional life writing object oriented code where I slap behaviours and data inside objects and get them to do stuff and that's true if you use Java, C++, C Sharp, Python, JavaScript, <laughs> scary times, um, because that's how they all work. We decide what has to happen, we decide what we need to store, and we make these object things and from a design point of view what you really should do put, is put all the behaviours inside the object that are going to deal with the object and make it look after itself. So, my bouncing sprite, I tell it, this is the box you're bouncing inside. It's from 00, 0 to 800 by 640, say. And the sprite goes, okie dokie, and it never does, and this is how fast you're going, and it never escapes from that box. So what happens is I start my, pro my game up, I find out how big the screen is, I tell all my bouncing sprites, hey, you're bouncing inside a box this big, please, and they all bounce around the screen. But they look after what they're doing in terms of the bouncing stuff, and I just call the update on them and say, hey, update yourself, move a little bit. It's been so many milliseconds since you were last called, so update yourself, please. And they figure out how fast they're going and do their math to move things along, bounce when they need to, and off we go. Does that kind of make sense? There's one thing which I'll mention which isn't in the script, but I'll do it anyway. Um, if I just go... This is a good one. This will get you thinking. Oh, I love doing this. 
public poop public override only one left get hash what do you think get hash does mashes everything together hmm say again so I mentioned checksum yeah. it's not a million miles away that's a really good thought um, when you go to the bank and you put your bank card in the machine what's the first thing the bank system has to do Hash it. yeah but in terms of once it's got your account number what, what does it have to do next compare it to accounts it has to well it's if it was a database it would be a lookup wouldn't it I put my card in it goes okay this is your account number Mr Miles I'm going to f go off and find your account record then I can decide how much money we can give you correct there has to be a process by which it takes your card number and it goes off and finds it now I think Kevin did some work with you last year on this in that if you have a list of accounts in a great long file one way you could do it is to basically search through the list to find the person with that account number so look at the first account num account. Does the number match? No, it doesn't. Look at the second one, the third one, the fourth one. Think about some poor soul with a great big card index full of cards. And I'm looking for customer number 356, looking through all those cards, trying to find the one that matches the customer we're after. Does that make sense? It's a fairly horrible way to do it. Um, Kevin will be suggesting things like keeping them all in order and then doing a binary chop to find out which way you're going to go and all that kind of good stuff. There's another way of doing it which involves a thing called hashing where you take a lump of information and you then effectively generate a hash key which is going to be the location of your object. Okay, so I do something with the bank account which generates a number which is where I'm going to put it and then I can reconstitute that hash code from information that I've given to take me straight there. And so what hash code does is it gives me the thing I can look for that identifies this thing as being a, the, the, that unique item. Uh, and uh, it's a bit like checksum, but not quite the same. It's a way of finding it. And uh, what you can do is produce your own hash behavior, which works through the data, produces the hash code, and then you could use that in an index to decide where to place it. It's The reason I'm mentioning it is because it's a behavior that you'd want to have specific to that object, like you would the equals and the two string. And so C-sharp provides a way in which you can build that one in. Because the one you get by default, I think it just gives the... Uh, uh, I, think it, I, don't know, I think it uses the location or the name string, I can't remember. But... That's the third thing that you might want to make your objects do, which is unique to them. And uh, so, yep, yeah, that's all rather nice. So, where are we? Well, objects are all children of this parent class. Everything we make has behaviours that are descended from it. And sometimes, when we're making nice, well-behaved objects, we'll make our own versions of these methods that will let us actually do the thing in a way special to us. Uh, and so we have a two-string behaviour which we will always put in so we can get a string description of the thing. Oh, here's a question for you. <laughs> Should the two-string method write the stuff out on the console for us? No. Absolutely not. Why not? Because if I'm writing a Windows app, there is no console. The Windows app can take the two string and put it in a message box, that's fantastic. But printing it out to a console is no good to us. It just returns the <coughs> string. A lot of people put write lines and things in their two strings uh, and then wonder where the messages have gone. Uh, the answer is, who knows? Um, it returns a string, that's all it does. And once you've done two string, you then go off and do equals because equals is how you test whether your save and load has worked. You don't you should never have two things that are equal in your system because the account number should always be different. Because the bank should make sure of that. And we'll do that. Next week we'll build a bank and we'll get we'll basically close the loop. So you'll be able to at the moment of the labs we're making the front end and the account class, which is fine. 
and then next week we'll kind of snap the next bit on which is the bank bit and the account finding bit down the side and after that you'll have built a pretty much complete line of business app and what you can do when you come to the coursework is just change the configuration of the objects inside and change the configuration of the container and then away you go so that's kind of where we're headed with this um, before I stop yeah anyone got any questions we're kind of not in Kansas anymore in that this is beyond just making for loops and writing procedural code we're now doing design of objects to make solutions that work and it's something like a <laughs> I'm going to sound very old but when I learned to program we didn't have objects they hadn't been invented yet and so I didn't have to learn this bit so I just had to do the for loops and stuff which was grand um, but you lot have got more to do the good news is that you can get more than three runs a day with punch cards like I used to so it kind of swings around the bounce as it goes but anywho any questions okay the lab is up um, there's a prize for the most interesting name generator uh, over and above the one that I've made uh, and so I'll see you folks again in the labs on Thursday I think and then next Monday